Hi everybody, I am Sandeep Gupta and this is lecture number 1 of C programming series. In today's lecture, we are going to study fundamentals of computer programming. So, if you are new to programming, if you don't know anything about programming, you should pay good attention to these fundamental concepts. While I am teaching you these fundamental concepts, I will assume that you know nothing about programming. So, let's start from scratch. If you want to learn C programming, the first thing which you should know is the definition of a program. So let's understand what a program means. Now, this is the definition of the program which I have given in three points. Let's analyze this definition one by point wise. Now it says a program is a sequence of instructions which accepts input, processes this input and gives the desired output. In order to understand this, let's take an example. Let's say I don't know how to add two numbers and I'm asking you to add two numbers for me. Now, if I tell you to add two numbers for me, what is the first question which you will ask me? Obviously, you will ask me for two numbers. Now, let's say I give you those two numbers as 5 and 6. So, what you are doing over here is, you are reading 5 and 6 from me. This activity of you reading 5 and 6 from me is called input. Now, once you take the two numbers from me, what is the next thing which you will do? Obviously, you will add these two numbers in your mind. Now, when you are adding these two numbers in your mind, what you are doing is, processing. So, the step number 2 over here is processing, that means adding 5 and 6. Now, after you add 5 and 6 in your mind, your mind knows that the result is 11. Will you now keep quiet or will you speak out the result? Obviously, you will speak out the results. So, when you tell me that the result is 11, when you speak out the result 11, you are performing the activity of output. So, if you look closely over here, what you did over here is, you took some input from me, then you did processing on that input, and finally you gave me the output. So, in a program, we write many instructions. And these instructions basically perform three tasks, input, processing, output. So that was point number one of the definition of the program. Now let's analyze point number two. Point number two of the definition says, a program is a sequence of instructions to the computer. Please take a note of the fact that I have highlighted the words to the computer. Now, what exactly is the reason of this? Understand one thing, every instruction is meant for somebody. For example, on the road you will see an instruction like, wear helmet while driving. Now, is this instruction for a person who is riding a two-wheeler? Or is it for a person who is driving a four-wheeler? Obviously, it is for a person who is driving a two-wheeler vehicle. Similarly, when you go to a restaurant, you will see an instruction, no outside food allowed. For whom this instruction is meant? This instruction is meant for anyone who has come to that restaurant for dining. So, the point I am trying to make is that every program is a sequence of instructions to the computer. So, when you write a program, you are instructing the computer, you are telling the computer, Dek, tujko 5 and 6 read karna hai. You are supposed to read 5 and 6. You are telling the computer that you are supposed to read 5 and 6. You are telling the computer that you are supposed to add 5 and 6. You are instructing the computer that you are supposed to show the result 11. So, please understand. A program is a sequence of instructions to the computer. Finally, a program is always written in a programming language. 
See, languages like English, Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati, all these languages are natural languages. A natural language is a language using which we human beings communicate with each other. But you cannot write a program in a natural language. You can't write a program in English. For writing a program, you need a separate category of language called a programming language. So, languages like C, C++, Java are programming languages. So, in this particular course, you will be writing lots and lots and lots of programs in the C programming language. And this activity of writing a program is called programming. So that was the definition of a program. Hope oh, you understood this very well. The next fundamental concept which we are going to study today is that of a computer. The first thing which you should understand is that every computer is a digital device. So now what is a digital device? Well, electronic devices are of two types. Analog and digital. An analog device can understand any signal, any power between plus V and minus V. It can work on any voltage between positive V and negative V. But that is not the case with a digital device. A digital device can work, can understand only two signals, two voltages, either plus V or minus V, nothing in between. Pay attention to these dashed lines. A digital device can understand either plus V or minus V. Now, if I am teaching you electrical engineering, I will call them as plus V and minus V. But because this is a class of programming, here onwards, we will call plus V as 1 and minus V as 0. So here onwards we can say, that a computer is a digital device which can understand only two things, one and zero, nothing else. Everything which you store in the computer, every information which the computer will process will be in the form of ones and zeros. So let's understand the various units of the computer and simultaneously I will also complete this block diagram which is right now incomplete. The first unit of the computer is called input unit. Input unit is that unit using which we provide input to the computer. So the simplest and the most used input unit is keyboard, then of course mouse and even microphone. Microphone is used to give sound input to the computer. By the way, in this discussion, whenever I say computer, I also mean a cell phone. Because these days, a cell phone is also a mini computer. Everything which is there in a computer is there in a cell phone also. I am saying this so that you can correlate better to my examples. So, for example, if you take examples, if you take microphone as an input unit, just remember Siri in iPhone or Google Assistant in Google in Android. Now when you say OK Google to your cell phone, what you are doing is you are providing sound input to your cell phone and that sound input is given through a microphone which is built in in your cell phone. So these are examples of input unit. Now. After input unit, let's talk about the most important unit and that is the memory unit. In order to understand memory unit better, what I will do is, over here I will draw the block diagram of the memory unit. Alright, so what exactly a memory unit is? The memory unit is itself a sequence of locations. So, this could be one location, another, one more, and so on. The memory unit itself is a sequence of locations where each location is called a byte. I repeat, each location is called a byte. Now, what exactly a byte is? One byte contains eight bits. One byte contains 8 bits. Now 
what exactly a bit is. A bit is either a 1 or a 0. So a bit is nothing but a 1 or a 0. So if you want me to repeat, the memory unit is a sequence of locations where each location is called a byte. One byte contains 8 bits. A bit is either a 1 or a 0. Now, if you pay close attention to this definition, there is one very important thing which you will realize. And that important thing is that everything which you store inside the memory unit is stored as a sequence of 1s and zeros. Whether it is a photograph or a song or a video or any document, everything which is stored in the computer is stored in the sequence of 1s and zeros. Remember one thing, a computer is a digital device, which means a computer can understand only ones and zeros, nothing else. Now, once you understand the memory unit, let's go to another unit called CPU. I'm sure you all know the full form, Central Processing Unit. The Central Processing Unit contains two units inside itself. One is called control unit, another is called ALU. ALU stands for arithmetic and logic unit and it will do arithmetic operations like add, subtract, multiply and logical operations like and, or and so on. Then you have control unit. The control unit controls everything which takes place in the computer. It is often called the heart of the computer because everything which goes on in the control in the computer is under the supervision of the control unit. The control unit will give directions to ALU or it will receive feedback from ALU. So, control unit giving directions, control unit receiving feedback. Now, finally, we have the output unit, which is used to provide output to the user. So, the most common output unit is monitor, then printer, speaker, which will give you the sound output. Now, let's try and understand how all these units interact with each other. And to understand that, we will take example of the computer adding two numbers for us. Let's say we want the computer to add two numbers for us. So obviously, what is the first thing which you will do is, you will type those two numbers on the keyboard, that means input unit. Now what the input unit can do is, the input unit can give these two numbers directly, directly to the CPU. Within CPU, the ALU will do the calculations, and the result will be ready. So if the two numbers typed on the keyboard are 5, 6, the ALU will come up with the result 11. This result 11 is now given to the output unit. So that is one way things can work. Now there is an alternative over here. The input unit may give these two numbers first to the memory. The memory unit will now give these two numbers to the CPU. Again, within the CPU, the ALU will do the calculation and the result 11 will be ready. The result 11 will be now again passed on to the memory unit and then the memory unit will give it to the output. So this is the way things work in a computer. The next fundamental concept is that of programming languages. Computers were invented way back in 1950s and since then there have been three generations of programming languages. I mean three categories of programming languages. Around 1950, the category of programming language which was used was called machine language. Then in 1960s came the assembly language. And 1970 onwards, all the languages are called high-level languages. 
So, languages like C, C++, Java, all of them are high level languages. Now, let's understand the characteristic features of each of these categories, starting with machine language. In machine language, only two symbols were allowed, that is 1 and 0. So, that means all the instructions which were written in machine language were written as a sequence of 1s and zeros. So, a program to add two numbers may look something like this. 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Something like that. So, this could be an instruction for reading two numbers. This could be an instruction for adding those two numbers and so on. The program was something like this. Now, it is quite understood, it is quite obvious that writing a program in machine language was a tedious task. Why? Because you have to remember each and every sequence of 1 and 0. So, to overcome that problem, developers came up with another category of language called assembly language in 1960s. An instruction in assembly language looked like this. Add 5, 6, sub, 7, 8, something like that. These words, add, sub, these words are called mnemonics. Mnemonics are basically small, simple, English-like words which were used in the assembly language instruction. It is obvious that doing programming in assembly language was not as tedious as machine language. But assembly language and machine language, both of them had a serious disadvantage. And that disadvantage was that both of them were machine specific. Now what exactly this term means, machine specific? In this discussion, when I use the word machine, that word machine would mean a computer. So let's understand what it means. Now, let's say you have a Dell computer and your friend has an HP computer. Let's say you write a program in machine language on your Dell computer. This program which you wrote in machine language on your Dell computer, it may work properly on your Dell computer. But when you take the same program to your friend's computer, HP computer, it will not work on that particular computer. Why? Because machine language is machine specific, which means every machine, every computer has its own machine language. So, this instruction may add 5 and 6 on a Dell computer, but the same instruction may not be capable of adding 5 and 6 on HP computer. The same was the case with assembly language. In assembly language also, the mnemonics were different for different computers. So this could be the mnemonic to do addition on Dell computer, but on the HP computer, you may have to write something like this. Notice the difference in the mnemonic. So both of them, machine language and assembly language were machine specific. To overcome this disadvantage, around 1970s, Developers came up with a third category of language called high-level language. In a high-level language, all the statements are like English, like mathematics. For example, x equal to a plus b semicolon. It is quite obvious that doing programming in high-level language is not a tedious task. And high-level language is not even machine-specific. So that means... You do a program on your Dell computer in C language and that C language program will work very well on all other computers.